talk about spy crack and about how you know, your, ta your tax dollars at work, thank you. you, you You've been supporting the Central Intelligence Agency with your tax dollars since it was its inception in 1947, and uh, probably this this is the this is the most famous of all of the spy gadgets ever invented. Right? Get Maxwell Smart shoe phone. You uh, remember him? Yeah, remember him? Get, get, get Smart series. Well, I'm one of the few people who has actually talked on this shoe phone. One of my friends in uh, Hollywood uh, has the uh, the actual phone itself, and uh, one one uh, time he was giving a little dem dem quote demonstration of that at the CIA when he was he was doing a show, and uh, people say to me, "Well, did it work?" Now think about that question just a second. This is uh, this is 19. 1962, 1963, and uh, we have we have a shoe phone. And you ask the question, does it work? Well, I say for a Hollywood gadget, it worked awfully well. <laughs> it's, it's probably only worth you know a million dollars or so, something like that now. But the the development of technology and the interrelationship between the development of technology and espionage is the core of what spycraft is about. Spycraft traces the history of the use of technology by real spy operations, by real spies, from World War II to, to 2002, when we, when we uh, stopped the, the last story in the book. And it shows how technology in the early 1950s was a kind of a nice to have when you were doing spy operations, but by 2001, 2002, technology isn't just nice to have, it is an integrated part of our espionage activity. Stanley Lowe is the man who in 1942 headed the research and development organization for the Office of Strategic Service. The Office of Strategic Services was the predecessor of the Office of Technical Service. It was the America's first consolidated unified intelligence service. OSS was headed by General William Donovan, uh, and, and he immediately recognized the need for technology to be part of what OSS was trying to do. Now fundamentally, Stanley Lovell developed equipment to support uh, wartime operations, fighting. He, he developed weapons and, and technologies that were useful for for partisans who uh, fought behind the line, uh, special special equipment for the military services. He wrote a book about uh, his experiences called of Spies and Stratagems, published in 1963, and, and he tried to detail some of the pretty cool things that they developed, such as the cigarette pistol. Now, cigarette pistol, uh, I don't believe I could probably bring Don down at this distance with the cigarette pistol because it was a one-shot 22. But if you if you had that uh, in in your pocket and would get this close, you could do some pretty good damage to an opponent. So so these these were the kind of some of the special devices that they developed. Uh, another one that I particularly liked was called the bat bomb. Now the bat bomb this this concept was. If we would put incinerary devices on bats and drop a million or two of these over Tokyo, the bats would fly down, seek shelter underneath the, uh, the roofs of the, of the paper, the wooden, uh, wooden structures in Tokyo. Uh, the, the incinerating devices that they carried with them would be timed to then ignite, and we would burn down Tokyo. <laughs> Good, good idea. Okay, what, what happened? Well, before, before you want to turn it out totally, you probably want to test it to see if it would work. And in fact, we tested it at an Air, Air Force base in southwestern United States, and in fact, inadvertently burned down a couple of their hangars. <laughs> so at, at that point, there, were, there was some discussion as to whether this would actually be feasible, and uh, the, the, uh, so, someone decided that actually getting bats from America to Japan in the kind of numbers that we needed were probably not, were not practical. But this was the kind of imagination 
that Lovell and his cast of characters uh, would, would try to do during the Second World War. So, and here's the, here, here's the concept of the bat bomb over Tokyo, right? You see the cage with opening up with all the bats flying. Okay, you know, you say, what else can we do? Well, in 19, not in 19, I'm sorry, 46, the, uh, the American government in the Moscow received a gift from Soviet school children. And that gift from, Soviet, from the Soviet school children was in the form of a carved wooden plaque. Uh, a wooden plaque like this, great seal of the United States. It, it was actually about four times the size of this seal, given to the ambassador, the American ambassador, with thanks for all the wonderful cooperation we've had during the Second World War. The ambassador received the plaque uh, thanked them profusely and hung this plaque in his office in Moscow. Six years later, somebody said, I think we need to be suspicious of the plaque. And they took it down and they opened it up. And in fact, in the back of the plaque, hidden in the plaque, was a listening device. A passive listening device uh, developed by a Russian scientist by the name of Lev Theremin, uh, who also developed the, uh, the musical instrument, the Theremin device, that then became the predecessor of the Moog synthesizer. Well, uh, you know, in his spare time when he wasn't doing music, Lev Theremin was doing spy devices. And this device, when found, uh, absolutely buffaloed American uh, CIA and British intelligence scientists. We did not know how it worked. It took us several years to learn that it, it worked by the, well, what the Soviets were flooding uh, this, path, this passive device. Uh, sound would enter the chamber through a pinhole in the eagle's eye. And when, as, as sound was captured in the, in the chamber uh, and, and the vibrations were induced in, in the diaphragm, the the flooding mechanism, the, the flooding from across the street uh, would get a return signal and that could be demodulated and the conversations heard. The problem with this was that, um, that now Americans were in a position to realize that they were vulnerable virtually anywhere in the world to their conversations with a device, a technical device that we didn't understand very well. It took us, in fact, five years to figure out how it worked and to actually replicate the device. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the meantime, uh, we, were, we felt that we, were, we knew we were susceptible to what, to, to what the Soviets were doing. In fact, this was so secret that uh, it, it uh, became one of the most closely guarded secrets of the CIA and was only released in 1960 when, interestingly, Gary, Francis Gary Powers and his U-2 airplane were shot down over the Soviet Union. Perhaps some of, some of you remember that. Uh, this is a picture of Powers and the U-2. The U-2 was, in fact, the CIA's first major technological breakthrough. It was a high-flying uh, reconnaissance aircraft flew at 70,000 feet. It was untouchable at the time by Soviet in 1956. Uh, by, by Soviet anti-aircraft or, or MiG fighters. But by, by uh, 1960, uh, it was vulnerable. Powers, Powers was shot down, and Khrushchev made a major international incident out of it, calling, it uh, calling off or sabotaging the planned Paris summit in May of 1960 with President Eisenhower. Well, you know, we were, we, the United States, uh, you know, we're kind of off balance in terms of international relations at the time, and the Eisenhower administration said, well, let's do something dramatic. 